establishment and search for a way to relate to their people and to the people of the Americas. Colombia, like many rapidly growing countries, is using a model with concerns for production of food and fiber to maintain and improve the lot of its increasing population as well as for the economic, social, and physical changes which are interrelated within the normal parameters of national development. The focus of the study and planning development on problems related to the development of outstanding systems in the agricultural sciences and with the national educational system in their broadest context. The mission was undertaken under the auspices of, in my case, the Rockefeller Foundation. We dealt with several agencies, one being the National been in existence since colonial days and they have complex prestige and reputation to enjoy. A national institution, the Colombian Institute for Agricultural Research, Esteban Bacos, uh, and particularly the Colombiano Ministerio, and a international organization, the Centro Internacional de Agricultura Tropicana, or the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, which is really the broader scale operation to deal with research and means and methods of raising a greater food product. Colombia, like many other emerging nations, are as well confronted with a growing population, about three and a half percent per annum. And as we well know today, food is not available throughout the world as it has been. I suspect that everyone here has always been well aware of where the next meal is from. Many nations people do are concerned about where they will receive their next meal. The concern for tropical agriculture deals with location Line and connects at the Andes, very prominent valleys between the Andes, the Alpha Valley on the well, between the first two ridges of mountains coming from the left, and the Magdalena Valley as the larger opening valley, and Los Islands of Colombia, rather rugged, very lush vegetation uh, at the land. Uh, but it's not a rich agricultural area because of topography, erosion, changing topography. These are vision looking from the Andes out over the Llanos, a vast untapped resource still, a very, very small population. Uh, a drainage system, natural drainage system. The local people at their morning laundry.
cattle. A major city, the capital city of Bogota, looking from the Paramos down into the Savannah. Two and a half million people. Very much an urban environment. A very highly developed city in terms of activity. Monteria 
site is called Turiapana after a local Indian princess. And the site is unique in that it provides all of the major difficulties in the site planning of these description of lowland hot humid tropics. This is a plan of Columbia delineating the lowlands below a thousand meters in the hatched area and the three cordilleras of the Andes moving to the north and up in the upper sector of this plan you'll see Monteria and Turipana again represented by a circle and this was the major experimental site. Another experimental site that you'll see in the lower middle to the left is Palmyra which is in the Calca Valley again an experimental site to determine what agricultural products can be raised and developed at these altitudes with these rather austere conditions. The other circles which you see are experimental sites which are being purchased or have been purchased or being surveyed and considered for the agricultural research that can be undertaken in Colombia. This is a more detailed plan of the site at Turiapana, and you'll see the village of Monteria here on the lower left and Cerrote at the top, connected by the Sinu River and its tributaries, which created a rather difficult situation that the Sinu River overflows continually. I guess this is one of the contributors to the rich soil, but it also creates the problem of draining the land. So one of the first recommendations was to devise a canal system to reach from this site approximately 200 meter, or kilometers, kilometers to the ocean, to the Caribbean, which is a rather major undertaking to dig a drainage canal 200 kilometers in distance. And at the same time to drain the area immediately available in the Turiapana area. The Sinu River drains a very large uh, valley or water basin and one of the local interesting stories about there is uh, because of the humidity and the heat and working in that site the first day all those who worked there including myself found that we were still cleaner than the Sinu River but the second day we were dirtier than the Sinu River therefore it was appropriate to, to bathe in the river and come out a little cleaner than we were the day before. The site contains about 250 hectares and the interest in the agricultural development is to provide research for animal as well as grain and other tillable or cultivatable materials. Uh, you'll see the major highway cuts off a small sector of the site to the west which was identified for animal disease research areas because of its isolation from the rest of the site. Here's a sketch plan showing the drainage pattern. You can see the Sinu River here on the left and the highway and all the drainage canals that are tributary to the major canal draining the entire area. One major consideration here was how to work with the local populations. It was an area that had a lot of political unrest, particularly during the revolution of the 50s. People were hungry, they needed work, they needed a reason for staying there. Many people were leaving. And this research area was one of the development aspects of attempting to maintain the interest of the local population because there were jobs, there was food product that would be produced, and hopefully there was reason to attract people to live there. To drain the area meant a major undertaking and also a asset to the people that the land would no longer be spongy, hopefully it would be cultivatable, mosquitoes would be reduced and maybe even eliminated, a sewage system was involved and a water supply system.
several years ago, one of the people working with the exploration of this site found that every night his bulldozer, which he was using to drain the land, was dry the next morning. The radiator had been drained because that was clean water and it was potable. So he found that it was necessary to set up a big sandbag to filter water every day to fill his bulldozer radiator. And the local people found that the water that came out was clear and was almost clean. If they boil it a bit, they had very good drinking water. So by a few pure accidents, there was a, a way to provide a better way of life. You can see the actual site there as it's cross-hatched is broken up into grid patterns of various types of agricultural experimenting, experimental efforts. Corn was one of the major interests in developing a way to grow corn at this level, at this altitude, and this temperature. In Mexico, about eight, ten years ago, the, there was a corn developed that has a very high protein value that it had not been raised in this environment. And here the experiments were conducted and found that corn could grow in this hot, humid tropical area. And the corn, in fact, has such a fine protein value that children who were undernourished and very near death were hospitalized and fed this corn protein diet ground into a fine mesh or fine meal mixed with water. And within eight to nine months, most of the children are brought back to a level of nutrition normal to children of their age. So this was an opportunity to really provide a cheap food product that could be made available to most anyone in the country. And through these experiments, this is hopefully taking place today. Another part of the activity was to provide uh, a research station for agricultural scientists to work in their scientific method of determining what foods could be produced and therefore it was necessary to build laboratories where people could actually work in a total environment that would allow them to use scientific apparatus to search for the best agricultural methods for this environment. Mm -hmm. This presented several difficulties because of the conditions of heavy rainfall during August up to almost a meter of rain during one month to a very dry uh, period during March of three millimeters of rain. Since it was close to the coast, very high winds were available. In fact, the uh, spinoff of several tornadoes were available had blown through the area and winds approaching 100 miles an hour were not too uncommon during June, I believe, no, I'm sorry, August and September, of course. So it was necessary to provide a way to shelter people from high winds and heavy rain. You have to give them adequate ventilation that the humidity and the temperature were not to the extreme that human comfort was impossible. Air conditioning and uh, sophisticated mechanical equipment was not considered several reasons. One is the tremendous expense. Two, it was just out of place. No one really had used such things in this environment. Three, there was electricity available, but the power surges varied from around 200 to 270 volts, so any electric motor would be burned out within a few weeks. So it was necessary to think in terms of designing a tropical architecture that would provide a comfort factor to the human being who would work many hours in these laboratories. Also, it was necessary, necessary to provide a li research library, housing facilities, eating facilities, a place for workers, field workers, as well as the agricultural scientists, and in some cases to provide housing for families and nearby a school for children. This is a very sketchy plan of the emerging site 
plan, and I'm sorry I don't have a better slide of this. I had some slides made in the processing. They got pretty well fogged, but I think this will basically illustrate what we were dealing with. And this probably gets closer to the architecture of the site. As you can see in the right-hand corner, the prevailing breezes come from the southwest, therefore orientation of the buildings to gain the prevailing breezes was important. The sun coming from west to east, we attempted to minimize in terms of its exposure to the buildings, therefore the buildings were oriented on this axis so that the sun was exposed, the buildings were exposed to the sun on the shorter sides. It was important to have enough space between buildings that breezes could move in and out and to develop a landscape plan, which I don't have with me, so that the plant materials could cool the breezes as well as slow down some of the heavy winds and provide shade for the buildings. The construction methods were simply the construction methods available in the area, uh, basically a masonry construction with white stucco walls, uh, some concrete work built purely by local labor. Steel, of course, was very difficult to come by and had to be hauled in from Medellin, a trip of about two days by truck over some difficult roads through the Andes. Uh, clay tile or the Spanish tile was the best roof material available, even though it was the only material available. It provided a good drainage as well as good insulation with the cavity or the void between the curvature of the tiles. The buildings off to the right, the larger building is for the uh, residents, for the bachelor scientists, and the smaller building for the uh, local workers who were quartered there. This is a sketch of some of the sections of the buildings that were developed to allow breezes to move through the building, uh, providing double spaces where privacy was not necessary so that air could move up and ventilate through the roof system. As you'll see, practically every building has a, at least two open walls for air to move through, and by providing the shed roof, the air would move out the top of the space. Uh, you can see the scale of people on that second section, so there was a fairly prominent ceiling space in most of the buildings that allowed the air to move up, the hot air to move up and escape. One of the things that we found and developed in the tropics many years ago is the old uh, rotating uh, fat blade uh, fan that I think all of you have seen in the tropical movies. Uh, by using such mechanisms as that or simply just movement of air in any way, provided a cooling mechanism as well as keeping insects from lighting on paper and people. And evaporation of people, of course, is one of the best cooling methods there is. So as of this point, these buildings that are under construction, in fact, uh, most of them are finished now, and this site has become a real honest-to-goodness research station. And the food products are beginning to show themselves here and there on the market. a sketch plan of the total site. I don't know, can you visualize what it may look like? Uh, the attempt here is to use local materials and to produce an architecture which is sympathetic to the local environment. People who had lived there for a number of years, for many generations, had probably developed the best architecture possible. The thatched roof ventilates beautifully and allows air to come in the bottom and hot air to escape through the top. One of the nice things about a thatch roof is you never need a chimney. If you build a fire, the smoke simply rises through the chimney, through the thatch and uh, dries out all the mice and uh, snakes and things that get up in there and uh, provides very nice ventilation. I think the first time I ever saw a thatch roof with a fire downstairs cooking breakfast, I, I was concerned that the building was on fire and rushed in to tell the owner and he had a good laugh at the gringo and uh, didn't know how to deal with these things. And 
sketch plan here of what the buildings hopefully are looking like today. I guess that's my 30 minutes. Thank you. One of the um, one of the difficult things about bringing three people here and asking them to talk about work outside the United States is that generally, if you find three good people, there are going to be three very heavy travelers. And um, I must say, this was certainly the case with the three that are here this evening. The next speaker, Mr. Hugh Newell Jacobson. I had to call at a friend's house in London and uh, try to persuade him to come here. He's um, a fellow who's been here before a couple of years ago, and we're absolutely delighted to have him back with us again to speak. Hugh Newell Jacobson is a name that is that is rapidly becoming synonymous with excellence in design. And since for this jury we had to have an educator, who you've just heard, a designer, and a publisher, or a, or, or a, um, a person from field journalism, um, the designer that we have, I think, is a real designer's designer. He was educated at the University of Maryland, at Yale University, and at the AA in London and he began his practice in 1958. Since that time, he's received over 50 awards for his designs. He's on so many national boards and, and advisory panels and boards of governors and so on that I, I uh, it would take me his full 30 minutes to, to read you that list. He was in 1973 chairman of the AIA's National Committee on Design and has written quite extensively and writes periodically for the Washington Post on urban design. He has lectured throughout the United States and in 1970 was visiting professor of arts and humanities at the University of Cairo in Egypt. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. He is the recipient of the uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy Memorial Fellowship from the Government of New Zealand. He holds an honorary Doctor of Humane Letters from Gettysburg College. And since we have the editor of Architectural Record here tonight, I want to point out most significantly that each year Architectural Record uh, gives awards to 20 houses that they feel are um, the most worthy of, of note in the United States. Hugh Jacobson, in addition to his two national design awards, has won this architectural, has been included in the architectural record for nine years with his designs. And I want to say we're very, very happy to have you back with us again tonight, Hugh Jacobson. Very far. Can you hear it? It's down there. That's good. Yeah. All right. Um, it's with great pleasure for me to be here again. Normally, when I'm asked back, which this has never been normal, I never have been asked back. And I always was expecting that there'd be a welcoming committee and some car and others come back. It's very nice to be back here. And I like the building. It's much better than Kwanzaa Hut than I've been before. That's not very high praise. I think. Um, it's a funny thing about our profession and our art. Um, you can get typecast like Lassie very rapidly. Uh, I have been doing houses uh, since I practiced, opened my practice in 58, and uh, I like doing houses, but it's very hard to convince somebody that you can do something else. Now all of a sudden, I find myself, it really is all of a sudden, having things uh, that are larger, brick friends and laid it on me one time by saying, are you doing anything at scale? You know, kind of a neat way of it. But anyway, at this time, I find that I'm an expert now, as in Lassie, in libraries, the universities. I don't have any out of the ground yet. You know. But I suddenly have three. <laughs> and it's funny how it goes. But anyway, the thing I think that should 
the non my office and my practice, um, which again I'm very proud of, is that I have four architects. My office is above the dry cleaner, and a block and a half from a block from my house. Um, it's really like in the stain. I feel like doing this all the time. Okay. Could I have some slides? Now, this, of course, is Paris. And Paris belongs to all of us. Good architecture, like bad architecture, knows no boundaries. And that's our town. As much as New York belongs to the world, and Chicago and New Orleans. Now, this is something that, as far as Americans working abroad, that I believe very, very important. The role of an American architect abroad is not to build a building in a foreign nation that says only with our clout, our power, our talent, and all of our bread could this building possibly be built. The building that we see here, now, this is the Place de la Concorde, the famous mews in front of Gabriel's Crillon and Nice de Marine. And there on the corner, what is that rude thing rising up? What in God's name is going on? Now this is the thing, you know, the Americans, we invented this form, which I believe happens to be the best and one of the greatest contributions of architecture to man. I know very few cities that have gotten better by going up, but however, the skyscraper is something to behold, and it's a marvelous thing when done well. But now watch, there it sits. You can't escape it. All in the name of progress. 2,000 years of Western civilization. This, by God, is the best we can do. Shame on us all. Now, I uh, a point that I wanted to start out on. I did not do that building. It is French architects that produced it. It is Maine Montparnasse. It is outside the historic district. Uh, that has been declared in downtown Paris, and it doesn't help, does it? Now, <laughs> this is not one of mine either. But, uh, <laughs> um, I have uh, uh, one project, in, two projects in Greece, and uh, I have this one to start out about what the disciplines and orders are. My site is outside of Athens. In fact, it is uh, right up the hill, right about there. And it's for an American college called Pierce Dewey College. It's a high school, and it was a junior college joined to it, and now it's a four-year college. It is uh, operated by an American Board of Trustees, uh, housed in Boston. It started as a religious school in the 20s. And in order to get the bread that Uncle Sam was spreading around, immediately dropped God and became an open school. And it then got on the dole and did rather well by it. Uh, now, as we go up there, but in 1966, the firm of Doxiatis, the Golden Greek, designed uh, the buildings that are presently there. And um, my job was to put a library in this thing. Now, the view from this superb site it's right down the valley, and uh, you can see through the smog after 11 o'clock and the traffic and the lift, you can see the Acropolis if you look just to the right of the Hilton Hotel. Now, if you look at the site, which that is a stucco block, and it's in a concrete frame, I think the building is really rather good. Uh, it's uh, straightforward, it has very elegant proportions in space. I take rather great exception to that is the view from the site. And if you notice that you can't look out in any of the classrooms. You see, he believed in this building that it would be distracting to the students. However, in the high school, it's all glass that controls the view. But anyway, this was my site right in here, where we were to put this building. And uh, we, uh, following the structural system uh, of reinforced concrete frame uh, with panel infill, we basically took the same form. Now, a thing that I found in working with on libraries, this was the connecting link. It's like a street that goes right through. Uh, Dr. Dallas, I thought, very ingeniously built the building right on the side of this hill 
and you'll notice the marble that's all underneath. Uh, it's difficult to dig in. And so he just went right down the hill, and at the main level, there's a street that goes right through the building. And uh, the school operates out of this one uh, rather nice building. Um, so I put my library, it's underway now, uh, uh, right where all this white stuff is coming up out of the ground. I'm dealing with librarians, uh, very similar to museum directors. They really are anti-architecture. They hate columns, walls, ceilings, and floors. <laughs> and, uh, it's very difficult, you know, with us to do things without those. And the reasons are rather good, because the uh, purpose of a good library is to have a, a, a collection that can expand. And they start off always very small, for two or three volumes. And people hope to, you know, die and leave money and then they buy more books and the collection must grow. And uh, the things that are determined in libraries is that really determine the module of the columns and therefore the lights and the ducts and everything else is this space between the two bookshelves. And if you're very, very crowded, it's like three foot seven, and if you've got a little more room, it's four foot two. Uh, I'm not very about the dimensions, but it does vary that way. And it means that if you therefore have your columns at 16 feet, that means the lights in order to read the book on this side and on that side must be exactly overhead, which then dictates a module, which is also the structure and everything else. And it seems that the librarian, whatever, must therefore keep his books exactly on that place. You can't break it up and say, well, I'm going to have a seat in here today, but I think he nice to magazines in this place, because the architect, because of the column, because of the lights, is trapped. So it's, uh, you know, the phrase in our work is that, uh, you know, there's nothing that money can't cure. And you can now, through the space program, you can cheat on gravity. And it says, well, and what we really need then are very large spans get rid of as many of those columns in the way and try to get a lighting system that is absolutely flexible. So I bear from here to there. And in this library, it gives me about a 50-foot space going all the way around that's clear. And so that when we get to the, remember I showed you that sort of street that I call in Ducks Alice's main building, which is about here. You then come onto this plaza where we have a little sunken amphitheater and some planting, because this is one hell of a hill going up. And we go across this bridge, and uh, once you're in the bridge, there's a glass box, and the stair goes down, you see, and then you come up down below, and there's a bridge across, this is where the uh, uh, card catalogs are. And, but it's basically a square thing, and it's all glass, and you can look out and see the view, hooray, hooray, for the first time. And because of the sun, which is very, very bright, in that part of the world, we have sunscreens going all the way around the outside. Now, all libraries uh, have to add on, hopefully, will suddenly have the holiday success, and lots of Americans dying with lots of money. So the library will double in size, and then we will just take another one of these things and lay right into that area, and the entry, the main entrance, will come in from down below. And this building is underway. Uh, the model is, when you figure, <laughs> that model is about four inches square, and you blow it up to size, it's very scary. But uh, it's, uh, there are problems when uh, uh, in dealing abroad, uh, as you might imagine. I mean, we have uh, they have a different light problem. It's hardly a problem except glorious the great sunlight, and it's out all the time, or most of the time. Uh, the contracting and bid procedure is indeed quite different. Uh, there's a great deal, and this is not a sweeping generality. It's more of a way of life of of a uh, oh, it's crooked. <laughs> and we put the thing out to bid twice because it smells so high of corruption and it's funny. And we now have a firm in there that I really believe very much in is uh, very honest indeed. The normal bid process uh, makes life in Chicago look like a group of Boy Scouts. So, uh, now, this is the street in Cairo uh, where we're doing the library for the American University in Cairo again an American school founded in the 20s by Methodists uh, out of New York. And uh, they suddenly became a straight university, a school, a college, and uh, got in line for grant money from the United States in order to exist. The Board of Trustees is 
100% now, yes, they're 100% American citizen. The curriculum is accredited in the United States for the 3,500 students. It follows the basic curriculum that all universities do here. And uh, the student body is about 80% Egyptian, and the faculty is 51% American by uh, law in Egypt. Uh, there are two campuses. One uh, was a very elegant uh, house built in the 19th century, early to mid 19th century, and uh, before the ABC bought it, was a cigarette factory, which I think is kind of neat. But and it sits right downtown Cairo, which is one very huge town. Uh, all of the drawings that we see for uh, population explosion, you know, shows people hanging out of windows and living on top of roof. Cairo and Egypt. The population of Egypt grows 8% a year. In Cairo, this street scene here is like normal. They sleep in shifts so that they can live and walk on the street at night. It is no different at night than it is in the daytime. Uh, I absolutely adore the place. Uh, it's, well, if one is the safest place I've ever been to. You can walk any place in Cairo at any hour of the night, and you never once have to look over your shoulder. People are marvelous and friendly and in terrible problems because of poverty and a growing, growing population. Now, the two campuses of the American University in Cairo, there is one, uh, as I said, the cigarette factory, which is the main campus. And it is an enclave, with very high walls. It sits right on the main square of the city of Cairo. Inside, it's a green grass, and lovely palm trees, and, you know, beautiful kids all playing around doing homework. And it's separated from the city. To get from that campus to the next campus, you must go out on this street. And there is a tendency. You see, there is the next campus, which we will work up on. But there's a tendency in all colleges, as all of us went to university from all sorts of odd parts of our own country, but very few of us ever go back home. And in the third world, the purpose of these universities and schools is to teach people to go back home to help that situation at home and the overall growth and progress of the country. Now, Normally, the student that, comes, that goes to the school begins to cut himself off from his own countrymen and what is out there in the street. You know, we call it here the Ivory Tower before you get so far up in it. And you start crossing your legs with the navel and forget why in the world you came. Now, this is the, again, is my site. There are two tennis courts over that fence. This was a 1935 British Army barracks, which uh, then became the Greek school, and uh, the AUC picked it up in 1947. Uh, this is a bordello, uh, which is very handy for the campus. It is coming down. Uh, I think it's really sinister. You know, all the shades are pulled very neat. There's marvelous sort of ulo type men in the business who sort of hurriedly scurrying out of the door all the time. <laughs> now, uh, this, again, are the tennis courts, and there's a busy street, you see? And this is pure army bearing stuff. You know? right. Reinforced concrete, that height is about 14 feet, and marvelous little problems with the plumbing for that whole building running above ground, things where I want to go. So, the problem is how you can get students. There is the, this sort of oasis, you see, that's in on the inside. This building is an apartment house that has turkeys and goats on the balcony, and everybody looks down into this oasis. And this is part of the Department of Social Studies. And this was my site, and I've got about 10 feet in between the two. And how in the world do you get somebody to come from the other campus, go diagonally across this tennis court to get into there? And uh, if way from the campus, which is behind me, is you go somewhere through there and you get into that thing over there. So we started up here. There's that corner. This is the tennis court site. You see right in here. And we came through. We drove a path by right ground level. And you are like in a tunnel from this point to here. And at that point, the, there is a sunscreen. You are in sort of an open court, as you'll see in the drawing of that. There's a sunscreen some four stories above, about 65 feet, and these are steps that come up, and I tore down this wing of the Department of Social Services. 
and the Meadow Plaza alley. And again, this point of the large span. The, these spans here are 80 feet. And so our great beams here is they're going in that direction, accenting the direction of the traffic as it comes into this green oasis and back up on around the plaza and across the bridge and into the main floor. The lighting, as in the library that uh, we did for Pierce to read, is a black anodized egg crate uh, so that it lights surfaces and books and people. And it just goes right straight down so that I don't have any directional quality to my light or any module. And it says that, at least under this plan, these are the reading stations. But the next library in 10 years may want to put the stacks. These are all open stack libraries. There isn't a stack in a great reading room. And so they're all in there. This is the model. Uh, there comes this diagonal street, and they would come along and then walk up these steps. There are indeed steps here. This is an exploded drawing as soon as they come out of there. And these steps have 16 inch rises, very much like a bleacher to see. If somebody's late for class or somewhere, you can be taller to get up there, but it's much easier to come around the other way. Now, there you can see the spans and what, this ex what the exploded does. And there's the sunscreen up above, which this does face north. Now, I thought it would be kind of a neat thing, but if in an Arab country, if this could be a solar energy building, that would be very nice to wipe their eye uh, with all that oil, and we wouldn't need it for the power. And so we worked with our engineers to see what we could do in a country where the sun shines virtually all the time. You know, 365 days a year, you get very bright sun. It does rain there, but not enough, a lot in Cairo. And it seems, as engineers are wont to describe their trade, but they said that the art is not that sophisticated yet. That we could, uh, with the solar energy process, we could get enough energy to heat the building, enough energy to cool it, but we would still have to plug into the city to drive the fans, to move that air, to plug into the city to light the building, and plug into the city to the elevators. And uh, it's quite a lesson. You can't do it in Cairo. We've got a long way to go before we start getting in Indiana. So, uh, this again is another further view of the model. Uh, the sunscreen is no longer a grid. It goes on the diagonal. It's much better. We are underway with that. Uh, problems in Egypt, uh, it's a very, well, it's almost medieval in part. Uh, we had some equipment arrive last month. The piles are being driven now. And we had some, uh, actually, it was a uh, self generating system put into this building. Now, parenthetically, again, I did not want this building when it was up to be the only building in Cairo that when the lights went out, it was the only place that does in Cairo, the power theory all the time, to be the only building downtown lit up. I am no higher than the buildings around me. I tie in with it. I am built out of the same materials that they can do. And what I want my buildings to say is that an Egyptian architect can go in there and say, wow, why can't we do this? Because it's done with exactly everything that I've been working with for so long. There is a tendency in the third world and in every developing nation to build everything to look like Miami. Uh, a bizarre thing to do. You know, to build all glass buildings in Egypt along the Nile because it's a symbol of progress and that you're taking your part in the family of nations. Well, it's bad stuff. It's bad stuff in Miami. And what the worlds are doing there. And so it is trying to get this thing to a point that design is not stylizing, but it really, as you know, design never really comes about with your pen and pencil. It comes about in your head and in the dialogue with the people that are helping you build it what, as Lucan said, what the building wants to be. And then you go draw it out. But it's not until that point. So when it came to putting in a self-generating system, I tried to design this building when we couldn't get into solar energy, that you can indeed circulate air in that part of the world, because they've been doing it since the Fatimid period, uh, through gravity. The old houses in the Muski, in the Sukh, 
are essentially, if you can imagine, a row of house with, with a common party wall. You come in off this very noisy, very dusty, hot street, everybody yelling like out of the movies, and you open up this little gate, and in there is very shady, the forecourt. And the second floor cantilevers over this courtyard, and the third floor cantilevers over the second, and the fourth floor over it. And down there, there's a fountain on which you wash your feet. And those marvelous great big urns, you know, they're sweating and making the place very cool, and there are trees and so forth. Now, the house is made essentially of wooden screen, it's called Mushrubia, on front and back. Now, the rear courtyard goes right straight up, and it's the width of the house, and it's usually square. There's very little wind blowing in Cairo, and that sun hits in that back courtyard, heats that air, and rises and draws that cold air to the house. Now, we started a design going in this way, and this is basically why this funny bit of court came out of ours, because we wanted to get to that point where if we couldn't do it by solar energy, to use the same systems that the Egyptians themselves have been doing since the beginning of time. Well, the only problem is is that the wind blows from the western desert out of Libya and deposits about four tons of sand per minute. And the library collection can't stand it. So we had to go into a hermetically sealed building, which is very sad, uh, and then mechanically ventilate and air condition the space. But it's, uh, I wish we didn't have to. Uh, an office building, an apartment house, anything could have survived, but not a library. This is a site in Thessaloniki, Greece. Uh, I'm sorry it's not the right site. The view behind me is what I was after. But, uh, these are those exploratory shots of the day. That is the campus up on the hill built in the 19th century. It is a school called Anatolia College. Again, it's Board of Trustees are in Boston. And it is a boys high school. And across the road is a girls high school. And oddly enough, in the spirit of the Olympia, this building that we are doing is the first gymnasium in all of Greece for a school. Rather amazing. Anyway, up there are these 19th century buildings called Minnesota Hall and Dakota Hall. And between these things, my job was to put in a gymnasium that I could serve as an auditorium, could serve as a church, and all those things where you've got a spatial thing. And that is a schizoid as anybody ever visited Freud, of trying to get everything all into one space. And it's how do you do this thing and still not let the building look like the biggest dominant thing on campus. Now, I don't really think that um, any school with a gymnasium is the most important part of the building you know, on, on a campus. I think the most treasured thing you know, in any school is its library. Um, that building should express the rare quality and respect that we educated people hold of what we're about. A gymnasium by its very nature, 25 foot ceilings and this great big volume of a whale, looks awfully big. And if I put that thing on a normal site, it would have been the biggest building on campus. And I thought it was to throw the thing all up. I'll come back to this thing. But we put it on a hill overlooking that thing I just saw. And there's the existing grade line. See? Carry it out like that. And so we built this thing so that from the campus side, it is like the rest of the building. There's a concrete frame with stucco over cinder block as they build up, and a red tile roof. And here we are at a very almost domestic scale, and it is the lowest building from up here. Minnesota Hall does it much larger. And you come in there, and for the first time you get through the door, you can look outside. This is all glass. And for the first time, you see a view that looks out, and there's the ocean about five miles away. And it's fantastically beautiful. It was not a single building on the campus has ever looked at the view. Now, this being a gymnasium, you know, where one pays passive golf and all of that, but we also have to have religious services in there. And so I put popped out a little window, and this is all glass. That's about, you know, I guess 35 feet high. It goes out there. And the student body sits in here and they can't and all the rest of it. But what do you do when you say, well, so we have now changed the space, and this is now, because there's an electron there, we're now going to have a religious surface, and you're still playing with basketball hoops hanging in your face, and it's even 25 feet high. So I remember uh, going to the circus and watching the fantastic things that those riggers do, you know, 
when they bring cases out of the sky and, and the trapeze and everything, they're flying up and down, and they can put this stuff away. They they think it goes up and down. So we designed, again, an egg crate, in which the inch compartment is 20 by 20 inches and 20 inches deep. And this is out of aluminum, and it's in three sections. If you divide the length of the tennis court, I mean, of the basketball field court, in three equal proportions, they come out. These squares about 40 feet each, uh, 20 inches deep, and on top of this lie pigtail track lighting, and uh, so that you can have any type of lighting you want. And you can lower, you can raise these basketball things up and say, you know, there's a stock park, and they crank up against the ceiling. And I can bring that ceiling down to 11 feet. And then I've got a different spatial thing, and I can start whispering, maybe, or singing softly, or I can have a play in the middle of it change my space, which essentially is what architects are all about. All we do is make space. And we've got one where you can change it handily. Uh, I think it's going to be kind of fun to see. This thing also is underway, and it's very nice. There's a uh, very bad daguerreotype photo of a uh, model. I'm sorry about that. But, uh, the, uh, we managed to bite out of this thing in these areas, a, uh, an art school. Well, art school, that's it, one room for art, and there's another room for Charlie up here. But that, that we, there are exercise rooms and things in there, and uh, we managed to squeeze that out of the room and made it very happy. This is not beer. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, the Exotica stuff, but this is a, a project that we have in Antigua. Uh, which is in the West Indies. And it's an independent country that uh, was part of the British Commonwealth of Nations, and uh, it has been on its own now for five years. Uh, it has a healthy economy. 60% of the population are out of work. Uh, they can't get uh, uh, the sugar cane is dying because their machinery hasn't worked for two years to refine it. Uh, tourism is doing really very well. Uh, that's when it was acquired. We are working down there. Uh, the government is healthy, and they argue amongst themselves, and they don't hate us, which is very nice, very rare. I've enjoyed uh, this group very much. Anyway, it is, without a doubt, I think, the most beautiful beach. <coughs> We're only seeing half of it here. It is one mile from, where's my light? I have a light here. It goes one mile, from right around, and it comes right back to a point over at this end. And my hotel is down there. It owns, that's our property line, 250 acres, and this hill is 600 feet above that. And there's only one house that overlooks it, and that's this one up here. And it doesn't have any, you know, rude, awful thing to look at. The waves and the wind come right out of Africa, and the surf at this point is six feet, and here is three feet, two feet, and it's calm for children. It's an incredible thing. You can sit down there and say, where's my wife? Well, she'll be back in 10 minutes, and she's walking. So, my, when we went in there, uh, we <coughs> some new owners had bought it, and uh, there was an existing hotel with about 60 rooms, which was in here, and it had uh, it was cinder block with a corrugated asphalt uh, roof, you know, a fiberglass roof, and it had a uh, uh, it was painted turquoise, the floors were never red, and there were rude ethnic cartoons of sleeping antiquities on the wall to give atmosphere. And uh, pretty grim stuff, you see. And so we made a master plan along with what we thought after uh, we had talked to some economic consultants that we brought onto the team. And we determined that we, in order to swing it economically, a hotel in that area should have at least a 100-room hotel. And that we would build a series of condominium up here on the hill, the hill being 600 feet high, and the level of 300 feet above sea level, we would hit one tow puddle and build a hill town, going all the way around, of 75 houses. And uh, each two roofs make one house. And uh, the street, which would be at that one tow puddle, would be for pedestrian only, or, or golf carts that you could rent from up here to get up to your hill town. And in that street, houses all of the cisterns and catch basins and the electrical and everything else. And the houses just plug into this system. And that proved to be rather an economical way of doing it. 
we did the infrastructure and tennis courts and so on. Now, uh, this particular wing is under construction now of the 40 room, and it will open in December. And I have some pictures here later on that uh, show a progress photo of it. I'm very pleased as well as it's going. When we got into this thing, uh, most resort architecture in the West Indies and elsewhere does very funny things. They, they say, well, the West Indies are tropical, therefore it's Tongaleo time, you know. And uh, they suddenly take on atmospheres of Comtiki and the South Pacific and a very tropical thing. Well, the West Indies are, if it'll grow in Arizona, it'll grow in the West Indies. Only a very small part of the lead is actually tropical. This is very hard stuff. If you fall down, you leave. You know, there's cactus and yucca, and of uh, course, there's the occasional palm. And you get near that beautiful turquoise sea and palm tree, you know, you're right back to Somerset Mom. But not so. You've got very strong problems of wind and sun control. And there is an architectural heritage. On Antigua, it is very definitely British, 18th century. And it's very nice, simple forms. And what we thought we would try to do, first when we came in, is that, which we try to do in my offices, when we get any sort of project, is to control everything visual. And which is <laughs> not all clients want it. And, push. and so we got into this thing. And the first thing we did, we took the turquoise and liver building. And we hit a code that said, if it's masonry, it's painted beige. And if it's wood, it's painted white. And we will use a blue that doesn't compete with the blue of the sea for our accent. And that's all. Now, the first thing we did was we inherited, you know, Saltarini, of course, in iron. And uh, we painted that white. It was um, coral pink when we started out. And uh, we bought blue tablecloths, and we built this slat house, which is a very antique thing. But our slat house, which is an extension to the dining room, uh, it has clear plexiglass up there and it lets the light in and the wind comes tearing through here and it does reasonably well and when it rains because it does about 10 times a day each drop being about the size of a 50 cent piece and then it goes away and uh, it's, uh, it's really you don't even bleach or, or, or fade your suntan when it goes by now you see there's that green out there and it's, it's an incredible color and i always feel that anybody that tries to compete with that is going to lose now, these are the houses, but we built this model. It goes up, you see there are two bedrooms, and uh, three baths, and this thing, these things can double as uh, a bedroom to the kitchen. So you can shut this thing all up and have three rooms with three baths, and you can, so if the man that buys it can rent it, you say, uh, when he's not there, and help pay for it. Marvelous things like tax shelters, and things that I don't really understand. But that's what makes these things move. Now, the problem was to get up the hill so that the houses could cluster in the way of a village and not be in the way of each other. Here comes our street marching up to us on that one grade level and as it would go through. And there are each little house is, is sited differently. The terrace underneath the uh, living room terrace is always the main cistern or its private water supply. The gray water cistern is in the street that it plugs up to. And as we Sighted these houses one over the other. Uh, uh, this Marcus photograph, I'm sure that's about the size of your little fingernail, but it was a device <coughs> to show that when these things are sighted, you will never lose sight of the view, and that's the actual sight you'll get from up there. And uh, they, we have about four of these under construction now. Uh, there's a problem in that part of the world is that since the energy crisis, before the energy crisis, there were non stop flights from Toronto two from New York daily, one from Chicago, and there's now one three times a week from New York. And when you're putting up a hotel, if you can't get your people in there, you're in very bad shape. This, this is a, one of our drawings of the uh, uh, hotel wing, and uh, you see there's the grade level, and naturally you've got to catch all of your water up on the roof and save every bit of it, because there isn't any water at all down there, unless you catch it. Married in something as sacred as an eight foot two by four, like it's the god of all measures.
this always looks so sort of neat and cute. And there's the bathtub in the middle of the master bedroom floor. And it's all right if you realize that my clients both weigh in the excess of 200 pounds. Very nice I think just the word I'm taking over my time. Still in fact about twice. But the thing about workmanship is I've found working at least in the Virgin Islands, that there's a great myth about gringos going down there who really know how to rent, find something and get it through fast because it construction experts and American savoir faire and boy, don't give it to the natives because they're up to lunch and we really know what we're about because that's really what we're here for. But most of the gringos I have met down there in sweeping general pluralities and always very dangerous are refugees. They're escaping from something to be down there, usually. And they're either on the sauce or they're escaping a wife or a bad marriage. And it doesn't work out. The thing that I found with uh, in investigating around is that if you realize standing on that site where this is, that it doesn't take long for an American who's really quite able uh, uh, say the construction business uh, in, uh, in you know, the United States, and he realizes very soon that if he lays down on the ground and goes to sleep, nothing is going to wake him up. There's no creepy crawlies, no insects. He won't need a blanket. He won't get uncomfortable. The only thing that will wake him would be his breakfast falling out of a tree. And uh, you go native. It's really quite true. So consequently, the people who can build, who understand it, are the people that live there, the natives, and they're marvelous. This building, there's a corner bead in that thing. And that edge is the best I've ever gotten in my life. And look at those things. Boy, what's here? Very nice stuff. That's a hardship course there. Thank you very much. I've taken too long. They're beginning to see how you collected those awards. Uh, I'm sorry that we had, that I decided to limit the theme to works outside the United States because Hugh has a few things inside, some local projects that are pretty good too. Maybe uh, we could justify getting you back here again to talk about that. <coughs> um, Max Urban was president of the AIA in 1972 and been the custom for the presidents, past presidents of the AIA, to organize trips to foreign countries. And from what I understand, and I, I might be corrected, that Max sat down and wrote a letter to the president of the Society of Architects in the People's Republic of China, not knowing whether such a person even existed. After a while, he got a letter back. The letter, of course, that he wrote asked if he could visit China with a representative group from the United States. He did get a reply, which was favorable. I'm probably simplifying something that was a lot more complicated, but we don't have that much time. And um, he got a reply that was favorable, and representing the uh, field of journalism and architectural publications, he chose our next speaker, Walter Wagner, Jr., who is editor of probably the most famous architectural publication in the world, Architectural Record. And uh, Mr. Wagner, in addition to I.M. Pei and a whole uh, list of other architects from the United States, um, went to China last April and spent three weeks there. And um, he's going to talk about that this evening. Just to explain a few things about Walter Wagner, he was a graduate of MIT in Business and Engineering Administration. He was the editor of House and Home, Popular Voting, Factory Management Magazine. He's edited several books from McGraw-Hill and is, recently, uh, and is uh, developing one now on houses. In 1972, he won the National Magazine Award for a record issue which was uh, called a New, New Life for Old Buildings. This was the second time this award was given to the editor of a professional or um, a business publication. Uh, he has won many awards and done a lot of writing, and I think that most of you are interested, more interested in hearing uh, Walter Wagner than you are hearing me. There's one thing that doesn't appear on his bio data, which Hugh Jacobson was good enough to, to tell us, 
and that is that in addition to all these outstanding attributes, Walter Wagner sings a great musical comedy. Walter, we hope you sing up a storm here tonight. Okay, fine. Uh, you know, it's very hard, having had the rare treat of, of going to China, uh, there have been uh, less than 3,000 Americans in China since the uh, since the revolution in 1948. Uh, it, it's, it's like asking, you know, give me a, a quick description of what it's like in the United States and describe it to, uh, to uh, an African native. Uh, however, all you can do is try, and what I'm going to try to do tonight as I tried to do in the magazine, I think that uh, uh, to show as many pictures as I can very quickly, simply to give you some impressions and uh, uh, tell you some of the things that happened to us. Uh, is the sound all right for the room? Am I talking loud enough or too loud? Okay. Um, well, I think Marvin, Marvin described uh, uh, very well how we got there. It really was sort of a fortuitous kind of thing. I have no idea how Max chose the 15 people to come. Uh, it made 14 of us very happy, and 29,978 people sore as hell. Uh, but anyway, we found ourselves uh, in the last week in April, uh, having left Hong Kong and, and uh, gone through the jungle for 40 miles. We found ourselves at the, uh, at the boundary of Red China. And as some of you have seen in National Geographic, uh, there is indeed a little stream which separates the Hong Kong territory. From, uh, from the People's Republic of China. And there's a little bridge that goes across, and there's an unsmiling cat with a red star on his hat, <coughs> the rifle with a bayonet who knows how to say passport, please, in 87 languages. And uh, you hand him your passport, and you begin an extraordinary adventure which looks something like this. Could we have the slides, please? The pictures are in no... Uh, really in sort of a vague order, I've tried to establish uh, mostly a series of images. This is not a travelogue. Uh, we travel for a good part of the trip in uh, mini buses of the sort that you see ahead of us there, uh, which are made in China. Uh, and uh, a great many of the pictures which I should say in self-defense were taken from, uh, from these buses hurtling at high speed. And while they're really very nice buses, the Chinese are not very big on springs. Uh, just to establish the mood of red China, here you are. Uh, great billboards of this sort with uh, Chairman Mao's sayings. That one is, uh, uh, is really quite typical of a lot of such scenes. You say, we, we preferred not to know what a lot of them said. Uh, there were quite a few along the, with the long references to running imperialist dogs and that sort of thing. But, uh, Son of an image maker, just to prove that I actually were there. Each of us have a hamburger shot of ourselves standing in front of the Forbidden City. Uh, th this is sort of another characteristic thing in China. Everywhere you go, uh, you're you're greeted by the Revolutionary Committee of the commune, the factory, the architecture school, the whatever, and um, there's sort of a pat kind of thing that goes on you. You sit down, and um, the translation comes through something like this, warm welcome to American friends, and we all applaud. Uh, and then it says, before the revolution, this factory, this commune, this army group, this architectural school was a poor place indeed with a very low level of production and very poor quality. Uh, since the revolution, under the guidance of Chairman Mao and the Communist Party of China, either this unit is 4,000 times more efficient, or this factory produces 3,000 times more material, um, and you all applaud, and then you get on with the thing. It's a kind of a ceremony that takes about 10 minutes because the translations are very slow and arduous. We, we sort of got to know it all. Um, this is sort of another kind of image of China. The countryside is generally very beautiful indeed. This is West Lake in Hangzhou in China. Hangzhou is thought by the Chinese, and, and I must say I would agree with them, to be the most beautiful city in China. It's surrounded by these lovely mountains. 
and has this lovely lake. It's West Lake. And um, the Bunsing is typical. There's a Chinese restaurant nearby named the West Lake Restaurant. And all of the West Lake Chinese restaurants in America are named after this very famous lake. This is um, a family group in China. And the father was taking their pictures, so we took a picture of them, too. Um, there are still in China some of the beautiful old people that, that uh, we all remember from National Street. Those of us who were born before the Punic Wars uh, remember from the National Geographic. This, uh, this lovely looking old man was climbing to see a shrine that we were visiting. And uh, we asked his permission to take his picture, and he was very pleased to do so. There are all kinds of images like that uh, through China. I simply couldn't resist the, the uh, pagoda and the tree formations together. The kind of handicraft that we associate with, with uh, <coughs> the ancient Chinese arts uh, is not only still practiced, but this, this unbelievably beautiful doorway in the Forbidden City is uh, being beautifully maintained using all of the materials and skill and endless, endless, endless time to maintain it. the shapes. The uh, children, like children everywhere, are perfectly beautiful, and perfectly marvelous, very cheerful. And uh, these girls were, were part of a play that was uh, presented for us. Uh, there, are, there are some children, of course, however, who uh, live a different life. Uh, uh, this, is a, this is a road building crew on, uh, on a road in the north. Some uh, tremendous amount of hand labor that still goes into everything they do in China. A river in the west, a river in the more crowded east. Again, that's a picture that I suppose could have been taken, except for the bridges that have been taken a thousand or five thousand years ago. Very cheerful. Everywhere we went, we were. Uh, were applauded and cheered, and people waved at us, and uh, great cheerfulness. Well, with that series of images, let me go back to the border. This is the train that we uh, <coughs> we entered uh, China in uh, after the uh, customs uh, the customs difficulties and so forth. We had a very excellent lunch at the railroad station and boarded this train to take us to Canton. This this train is, was Russian. Uh, it's uh, very many the things are still left in China from the, from the days of all their Russian advisors. But those advisors left, you may remember, in uh, sort of a falling out that uh, Mao had with Khrushchev in about 1966. Uh, we don't talk about Russia in China anymore, but they still use their trains and some of their airplanes. I wanted to get this kind of image out of the way because there's very little militarism or, or police state presence in China. From what I've heard from people who've been to Russia, where there's, there's, there's some kind of a feeling that you're being watched quite a lot, it was our agreement that, that we had no such feeling in China. The, uh, the most militant thing <coughs> we saw were, were marching groups of children. These children are uh, some of the young red guards, or red pioneers, and they wear red kerchiefs, and they carry their communist youth flags, and they march. Uh, around the city uh, in, in a kind of a military manner. But it, it, we found it important that uh, there was very little military presence that we were aware of. This is not to say, of course, that they don't have an enormous army. You no, know, they do. And while you see a lot of people in an army uniform, you see very few armed. Uh, the police are not armed. There are an awful lot more guns in downtown New York City than we saw in all of China put together. We were having our official portrait taken in front of the Forbidden City, and these people gathered to watch us have our picture taken, so of course we took pictures of them. The, the, it, it sort of reinforces what we all knew, that the clothing of the adults in China is very draft. You have a choice of a blue Mao suit, or a khaki Mao suit, or a gray Mao suit. And if you're really daring, you put the khaki coat with the gray pants. Uh, <coughs> the children, in contrast, are, are 
as you can see in the foreground and we'll see more of later, are dressed very colorfully. And um, the amateur soci sociologists among us decided that that was one of the ways that the parents got some degree of individualism into their lives through the kids. This is a terrible picture, but I show it because it's the only one I have that shows. That's the bicycle parking lot. It's, uh, it's just extraordinary. There are just millions and millions and millions of bicycles. And uh, they ride them, of course, to and from work and to and from recreation. And how in the world, in a place like that, they ever find their own biking camp, I have no idea. And, uh, <coughs> And the right is one of three <coughs> stadiums in Peking. That, that one is the largest and is used for soccer games. The uh, bulk of the mass transportation in China is in buses of the sort you see there. In the crowded places, they have this articulated bus. You see a great many of them. Uh, the cars are all state-owned. They're available to uh, men and women of sufficient rank and, and title in the country on the basis of need. In other words, you don't have a car and a chauffeur if you're the uh, president of a large university, but you can call on one when it's necessary for you to have one to maintain your dignity. Um, the cars are, uh, I don't know how the Toyota got in there. The bulk of the cars that we saw were in fact made in, in one of two plants in Shanghai. They make, their buses are Chinese made. This is typical of the older housing in the center of Peking, where the wealthy families would have lived uh, in uh, the early 1900s. Um, they're really quite graceful in scale and form. Uh, a house would typically have several units of the sort you see there built around the courtyards. Uh, now, of course, each room in what once was a 10 or 12 room house with three or four courtyards houses an entire family and there would be 12 families living in the same space. More view of the, of the, of the housing. This uh, would have been built probably in the late 1800s. This is a shopping street in Peking. Uh, we, we, uh, we were down here to shop for, for Chinese, Chinese things. We bought a great many paintings and, and uh, uh, revolutionary posters are in those stores. We all bought chops, the, the wooden um, uh, I'm trying to think of stamps to which you sign your name. This is uh, this is typical of shopping streets in, in downtown Peking. This picture I, I showed at the beginning trying to talk to you about trees. Um, after the revolution in 1948, because as you know, the yeah really quite terrible conditions under which the people lived. Uh, most of the trees in eastern China had been cut down for fuel. And uh, the, uh, the entire eastern part of the country was quite denuded of trees, according to the report. Uh, one of the things you can do if you're a Chinese dictator is say, we've got to have some more trees. And uh, Chairman Mao began a program of um, Regreening China, and he called it that long before we even the word the green in China. And he gave everybody a stick 20 feet long and a lot of tree seeds. And uh, all of the roads in China, I don't mean most of the roads uh, or the roads outside the cities, I mean all of the roads are now lined on both sides, as the street is, with trees. These, of course, are quite mature and uh, must have been planted early in the campaign. But uh, to this day, the, the day they finish a road or a housing project, they plant trees along the sides of the road or in the plazas of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Is the sound level still all right? Uh, this is a, just a picture from um, my hotel room in PK. I became something of a Chinese national hero there. Uh, the basketball court down there soldiers were out playing very early in the morning and I was still having jet lag and waking up at 3.30. <coughs> and um, so I walked down to that basketball court where there were uh, two teams of, of guys playing. And I stood around for a while and they threw the ball at me. And uh, they still play basketball sort of two-hand style. Uh, and uh, 
for once, I made sort of a Jerry Lucas laugh, laugh from about 30 feet out, like my 12-year-old had taught me. And um, I hit it, and um, I was a little glad applause, and I made a couple of fancy shots. <coughs> and uh, pretty soon I was having a basketball clinic down on that thing there. <coughs> and uh, but somehow or other, they got across that they'd sure like it if I could go back tomorrow morning, which I did, and there were over 100 guys there. Uh, uh, I never felt quite so important in my whole life. I hope they beat the team from Shanghai. Uh -huh. There's another bicycle parking lot. Absolutely extraordinary. They're all black except for one guy we saw driving along in Peking who painted his bicycle yellow, and he's probably in Siberia now. <laughs> this this is the hotel in Peking, the hotel for for uh, for foreign visitors. As you can see, it was built by the Russians for the Russian advisors, and it's a little bit heavy. And uh, but uh, I've seen along the roads, no beginning the trees, these less mature. It's an absolutely staggering impression of greenery that you get in China. Just unbelievable. Some of the housing uh, they did from above showing the formations around the courtyards. These uh, these kids were on their way out to a to a work day. All of the students in China have uh, one day a week <coughs> which they go into the fields to do quote productive work. There's no such thing as work in China. Productive work is all one word. Uh, here they're on their way out to uh, some kind of field activity. Kids plant all the trees, by the way. Just pictures taken along the road of, of housing in, in the rural communities. There is uh, one story. It's highly, very dense land plans, not very imaginative, but uh, very dense for the reason that they uh, they need very much to save the arable land because, of course, they have an enormous problem of raising enough food to feed 800 million people. Another picture, you know, that could have been taken a thousand years ago, really. I never understood how skulls worked until I saw those guys going up the canal. Some of the housing is waterfront in China. Oddly enough, the water is, um, well, that's not too appealing, a, a picture of water. Uh, there is no disposal of waste or refuse in the water in China. Um, the water is uh, well, I doubt that that's drinkable. It's 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 uh, certainly clear enough, clean enough for irrigation. They dispose of nothing in the water. <laughs> uh, that's some work that uh, Hugh Jacobson did in China. <laughs> you can see the contemporary roof forms and. Uh, <laughs> That's really not a lovely, moody picture of this. The wrong kind of vector from the film, but I like the effect. This picture lets me talk about how the fields are cultivated up to the very edge of everything. As you see here, those uh, those rows of plants are up to the very edge of the road, the very edge of the buildings, and that is typical. Uh, there is very little flat land in China. Uh, and that land which is flat, and that land which they have been able to make flat by by, uh, uh, <coughs> by earth moving, it's heavily, heavily cultivated. There, there are still, you know, constant scenes of just astonishing and heartbreaking physical labor uh, through China. They're, they're very anxious to uh, get people like that out of harness. They're, they're quite aware what an awful life it is. The, uh, the uh, highest priority is to get people out of the rice paddies, which is must be a terrible way to live. Um, so that the, the uh, as they develop productive capacity, it's all going into agricultural machinery. Picture a lovely country, about six hours. 800 million people, you know, everybody says, wow, that sounds like a lot. It is a lot. There are just crowds of people everywhere. Here we are out in the countryside. Uh, just enormous crowding. The cities are unbelievable. This is the countryside. The shots taken along the 
grow this week. But that's the kind of work that they are most anxious to uh, to relieve. That's going to be a terrible way to make a living. This is uh, the hotel that most foreigners see. This is the Kung Fung Hotel in Canton, uh, built for foreign visitors to the Canton Trade Fair. On the right, of course, is the older section, and this was the newer section. Um, it was completed with Joe. It's, it's really not a nice building. It's, I mean, it's really not a bad building. It's, uh, um, it's, it's the great advantage of at least being simple. And the little platform down there is the bar where they, the only place in China where you can get American booze, and it's therefore very crowded. Um, their, their attempts at landscape architecture are probably not as successful as they could be. They used to do better 3,000 years ago. But this is really quite a pleasant place to be. Pictures of it. This is a hotel um, built up in the mountains outside of Canton, which was built for uh, <coughs> foreign Chinese. They have in China now a very active program of uh, trying to attract back to China for visits uh, Chinese who have distinguished distinguish themselves in other countries. And here, as you can see, they made some attempt to have a somewhat more Chinese kind of flavor to the building. This is, this is really quite light and delicate building. Um, we had a lot of fun at this building. We were this hotel. We were met by the Revolutionary Committee of the hotel, who gave a warm welcome to the American guests, and uh, said that the, before the revolution, uh, and they started the before the revolution kind of speech. And I turned to Jim Foley, who was sitting next to me, and, and uh, I said, before the revolution, this mountain was 2,000 feet high. Uh, since the revolution, under the guidance of Chairman Mao and the Communist Party of China, is now 5,000 feet high. <coughs> and Jim Foley fell off his chair. And um, we, we all picked him up, and it was a, a big thing. It was Mr. Foley all night. And uh, afterwards, the uh, political leader who was taking the ground said, uh, Mr. Lightnock, what if you were tell me a joke which caused Mr. Foley to fall over the chair? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I told him, figuring I'd be on the train to Hong Kong. And uh, that became one of the big laughs of, um, of the whole trip, which is because you have the sense of humor they have in China. This is really quite a nice hotel. That's the dining room overlooking a man-made lake. They diverted a stream through uh, through the rooms, it's lovely and cool, and the sound of water. And of course, their their, their uh, landscape architecture is just beautiful. And here we are up in the north, closer to the Russian border. Uh, this is this is in Shenyang, which is in Manchuria, and is the Pittsburgh of China. It's where the, most of the steel mills are. It's quite smoky, um, and it was cold up there. Well, this seems to be my series of grandiose buildings. This is the Great Hall of the People in Peking. Um, this is where President Nixon had that big dinner that we all saw television out. Um, this is an extraordinarily up large and ugly building. Um, interesting thing about it is that it was built in eight months. They, they, needed, uh, they needed a large and ceremonial building for a big deal with the Russians. And, um, so they designed and built this in eight months. And the way they got it built in eight months is that they had three crews of 2,000 men each on the job. Inside, there are some extraordinary views. Um, the Great Hall of the People, of course, has the, the great dining hall that we all saw on the coup. Uh, it also has the large uh, chambers for the, uh, for the assembly. China has. Uh, 30 provinces that have a relation rather to Peking, rather like our states to, to Washington. And each of those provinces or states has its own large and ceremonial room um, decorated mostly with the with the art of that part of China. This happens to be the Senshi province uh, room. There are 30 such states. There are 29 rooms furnished. And then there's one flank room for Taiwan as soon as they get around to it. Uh, 
This was this was in another of the uh, another of the rooms. I've forgotten which. I took this picture. As you can see, that's a very large scale tapestry. What it is is silk embroidery. It uh, it must have taken a cloud of people three years to make. This is the Canton Trade Fair building, uh, which they have just completed. Um, this is where all the foreigners come to to. Uh, look at and purchase Chinese goods. As you know, there's a very heavy export of textiles and, and clothing from China now. And this is where it's all bought. Take it from the roof of the home of the hotel. <coughs> if you were a foreign diplomat, this is where you would play tennis, and uh, this is the international club in Peking. This is the housing for foreign diplomats in Peking, just completed. Uh, well, it's a dubious form. The apartments are perfectly beautiful. Large living rooms with, with uh, great balconies overlooking the embassy area. Three bedrooms, two baths, uh, Western-style kitchens, and the rent is $100 a month. This is the um, great university in Shanghai, or what used to be the great university in Shanghai until the Cultural Revolution. Uh, College is really sort of out of style in China now, and, and uh, not only intellectually and spiritually, but also physically, the colleges were in terrible condition. This was a picture taken uh, uh, under the approaches to the Great Bridge at Nanking, which is their favorite engineering uh, accomplishment. Uh, I wasn't too knocked out by the bridge because I took this picture because I thought it was probably the ultimate one point perspective. Uh, there's three miles down in an absolutely straight line under those arches. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the traditional architecture and, and uh, skills of China are, are very much kept alive. Um, this is the summer palace of the last empress. Uh, it was built in uh, about 1890, the 1890s and early 1900s. She was deposed in 1911. <coughs> Um, you begin to understand some of the reasons why revolutions can happen when you visit a place like this. Um, after the Boxer Rebellion, the Empress was given all of the reparations. Um, and as near as we could translate from obsolete coins and so forth, it was about $60 billion. But what she was supposed to do with it was rebuild the Navy, and instead she built herself a summer house, and this is it. Uh, it's 250 acres, and she didn't like the sun. So most of the 250 acres are covered with walkways like this, decorated like that. And uh, uh, it's extraordinarily beautiful to look at, but but uh, you can, you know, when you think about how the money was used, you get a little upset, especially if you were starving outside the gate. Um, all of this, uh, all of these marvelous, marvelous old buildings. And, and temples are maintained now as parks. There is, of course, no more religion. Uh, this is a leaning, leaning pagoda. Uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, that's quite an extraordinary slant. My notes tell me how much it is, but uh, they get a little worried about it. You can't walk it anymore. Uh, again, all parks. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to focus on that. Uh, that kind of brickwork is hard to get to say. <laughs> this is, this is the boat when, the, uh, when some of the Empress's more nervous uh, ministers said that they thought maybe she ought to make a couple of boats for the Chinese Navy. She built this one. It's made of marble. <laughs> This is the uh, this is the Forbidden City. Um, the workmanship, as you can see, is, is just unbelievable, just extraordinary. Again, being beautifully maintained as national policy, um, the Forbidden City uh, is now a very popular park, and the place is crowded uh, all day, every day, with uh, with Chinese coming to see how the Mandarins used to live.
This is sort of another wonder. This is the Buddhist caves at Luoyang in the west of China. Uh, we especially wanted to, to see these caves. Uh, Max told us about it. He studied them, and, and uh, uh, they took us about 700 miles out of their way and ours to, to, uh, to see these carvings, which were done uh, about 800, 900 A.D., up to about 1,000 A.D. Uh, there were just thousands and thousands of these caves in scales from, uh, from very small, which we'll see in later pictures, very large. Thousands and thousands of Buddhas. It's kind of another wonder. Um, this tree, uh, I wish I had a person in it for scale. It's really quite a big tree. Uh, the way they accomplished that was they took a tree that was quite grown and they turned it upside down. And uh, these are the uh, these are the roots, which which jeez, uh, I pass us to all the ancient Chinese who lead. But the, just extraordinary kinds of work of all sorts in China. That's ivory carving. It's a, one of the thousands of Buddhas in the caves. It's the summer palace. That was a summer house for one lady. Uh, a series of pictures just to show the various kinds of art. These, these, uh, this animal was one of a row of animals about uh, five miles long that guarded the main tombs outside the Peking. It started with little friendly animals, and the anim animals gradually got bigger and fiercer, and then they got the warriors, which got bigger and fiercer, and finally, if uh, you'd gotten that far, you came to the real warriors, and you didn't get to see the main house. <laughs> More summer palace, more forbidden city. People everywhere maintaining these things. Nice for his whole life for one thing. But this picture back in Shenyang, um, showing the crowd, kinds of crowds of people who came to see us everywhere we went. Almost every time we came out of anything, starts in this case, from the Kelly Shenyang, there was a very large crowd of people who gathered to, uh, to see the Americans. Of course, they didn't know we were Americans to see them. That's got nothing to do with it's such a groovy picture, and I couldn't believe it turned out, so you'll have to see it, too. Steel Mill in Shenyang. This is just another wonder. You don't get to see things like that anymore. That was an engine of the steel mill in Shenyang. And now I guess we go to another tray. Another tray? Yes, I haven't used that all my time. <coughs> Rice patties. Just everywhere. They go on. There's a picture that, you know, could have been taken 5,000 years ago. Animals are the same everywhere. Uh, ducks, they they uh, they eat of course an enormous enormous amount of ducks in China, and they're they're raised in ponds like this. Uh, there there are very few chickens in China, and the reason given to us, and you'll have to forgive me because city boy, the ducks are much easier to take care of. And, uh, they also farm fish um, in, uh, in ponds like the one you saw with the, with the ducks in it. And they, that's their breeding stock and their super bowl there that he's holding up. Uh, those fish are just, the, the, the breeding fish are simply moved from one pond to another. And this commune in five such ponds harvested 193,000 fish last year of, of edible size. They want to clear a field in China. Um, they just get the people out to do it. So. It's a rather ancient form of boat. And this one, and perhaps some of you can see, it's made out of precast concrete. And the change of design. Endless, endless fields for growing food. This was uh, one of the little corner marketplaces. Each of the cities, each of the major cities in China is ringed by uh, by communes or farm communities. Peking has eight communes, something quite big. Two of them are on Peking, have 40,000 people apiece on them. 
And each commune in a, in a circle around the central city is responsible for heating a segment of the city. So that if you don't like the asparagus, you know exactly what form it came from. Uh, it makes for a very short and efficient food distribution system. The only food that's moved in bulk is rice from the south to the north and wheat from the north to the south. It's a very short and simple uh, system. Foundry work at about 1920 level in this country. This is an uh, assembly line. Again, it has a 1920s look about it, and that's about the way it is. This is a tractor plant. You make these absolutely enormous tractors. I want to bring one home. It's a Chinese Jeep. In front of the Chinese automobile, their, their level of auto design is 1948 Hudson. But the, uh, the cars are really quite comfortable. <coughs> they have a little rudimentary testing materials. That's about as technical as they get in China. Their, their housing and construction is mostly brick. Uh, and they use very simple pre cast panels for, uh, for floors. They tend, however, not to make any concrete piece that's bigger than guys standing around that can lift. The jet runway in Peking is made out of uh, concrete slabs about six feet long and three feet wide. We wondered why it was made that way until it occurred to us that that was the biggest piece of concrete that they could carry out and set down on the jet runway. Um, and the runway and the way of jet runways everywhere is two miles long. Extraordinary input of labor. This was a factory in pottery. Revolutionary Committee standing out front to do this. I just love that line and this friend in the cinema for the city. These were some of the um, some of the larger figures of the Buddhist caves in, in Luoyang. As you can see, it, it used to be a cave. The, the roof has fallen in, and uh, so it's now open air. It's just an unbelievable sight. Museum at the at the main tombs in which the the jewelry and art objects of the Ming emperors and empresses are, are preserved. Uh, I'm terrible the temptation to try and write a movie about you know raiding as they do about the, the Greek Museum. If you are a really organized criminal, you can get out of China with you know, just enormous wealth and wonders. They they don't guard their museums. And absolutely priceless jewelry is, is displayed in, uh, in simple glass cases. This is a picture of Yao Ming in his uncle's garden in, uh, in Suzhou. He was laughing there. It was really sort of a tough moment for him because uh, he remembered being in that house as a small boy. Gold-plated bronze sculpture. Can't hardly get that anymore. the Forbidden City. Handicrafts, this is the beginning of what they're doing on the farms. As I say, some of the communes are enormous. We visited uh, one with over 40,000 people. Uh, they have very little productive machinery, tractors, and so forth. But as they get it, they're intent on not permitting the kind of migration to the city that's happened in so many other countries, including ours. And they're trying to establish work other than farm work right at the commune. They're in the beginnings of factories, and they're going to keep the people there and uh, just try and avoid some of the uh, problems of urbanization. Yeah. The handicaps in China are very much kept alive. Uh, now they they might have a factory in which uh, there might be a hundred people making um, lacquered tables of this sort. They, they understand that there's a great demand for their, for their crafts around the world. And uh, they're keeping it alive in quite an honest way. The, the work is done just as it was done traditionally. 
Uh, there are no production shortcuts and so forth. Workers like this are work under the supervision of a, of a highly skilled craftsman. Uh, then the work is graded by, by excellence, and uh, the, the least good work is, is uh, sold domestically for tables for the very modest price, and the best work commands a uh, great price around the world. Um, and they're trying to keep alive the, uh, all of the arts and handicrafts that uh, we all value. This is a silk weaver. The silk embroidery, of course, is extraordinary. These, uh, these women were working on an enormous panel of the sort that I showed you in the earlier picture in the, in the Great Hall of the People. There would just be clouds of women working on a, on a scene. Uh, this piece of work had, had uh, already been three months and they expect it to finish in another year and a half. The, uh, I was no, I'm no expert on embroidery. To me, this was simply unbelievable and exquisite piece of work. And this was the most amazing one of all. I didn't know there was such a thing. This is two-sided embroidery. Uh, the, uh, the other side of that piece of work is not a duplicate of this side. It shows the other side of the fish in the correct perspective. Uh, absolutely unbelievable work. That took a woman three years to make. And uh, Sam Hurst, who's the dean of USC, was as popular as I was. But this is the kind of housing that uh, uh, was really quite common at the time of the revolution, and it's kept uh, it's kept just for that purpose in case you don't remember what it was like in the old days before Chairman Mao. Here it is. Uh, they built their they have a three phase housing program. Phase one, and this is some of the housing saved for phase one, was simply to get everyone in out of the weather. Uh, phase two is to get everyone in and uh, in a building which is heated in those parts of the country where heat is needed and which has running water, electricity, and uh, toilet. Uh, in many cases, the older housing is being remodeled for, um, for families. These houses, uh, these are country houses, again, one story of the roof shapes were really groovy. This is housing out on the, out on the commune, sort of a row house kind of arrangement. Those uh, those buildings in the country, there is more space for family. These houses have quite nice wood floors, bamboo rafters, thatch roofs, um, and again running water and, uh, and electricity. And in fact, this looks sort of like a leather town in China. This is housing along old housing on the uh, canal in Suchow. This is some of the new urban housing. It's all four or five story, red brick, red tile roofs, <coughs> precast concrete floors, brick walls, uh, brick partitions plastered over. Uh, and again here, uh, trees. This is housing in Shanghai that's uh, about 20 years old. Here the trees are mature. Really quite pleasant. Some some efforts at rudimentary decoration and the free cast uh, elements at the balcony. All red brick. Very little emphasis on labor saving and so forth for the reason that if China has nothing else, it has a large and stable workforce. Hard to get interiors, of course, but uh, this was uh, an attempt at a picture inside. Simple furniture, quite a lot of flowers, mandatory stature, a picture of Chairman Mao. They mostly have a radio. An extraordinary number of them have a world map. They're very well informed about world geography. And then, of course, the, just as we would, the paintings of their children and so forth.
to Shanghai in the, in the foreign section. Shanghai, now of course the most popular city in the world with 12 million people. And uh, being in Shanghai gives new meaning to the idea of crowded urban living. Uh, the crowds are just fantastic. That was a picture taken, not at rush hour, just uh, a normal time during the day. It's a picture from the hotel in, uh, in Shanghai. Again, notice the trees everywhere. This was a Wednesday morning about 11 o'clock in a park in uh, Shanghai. But enormous crowds. These children would have been those children who were out on their one day a week excursion, in this case to the Martyrs Park. Um, crowding is unbelievable. Some of the old uh, European sections, of course, you recognize some of the foreigners. The parks are beautiful. This is a park uh, outside Shanghai. Beautifully cared for. These were kids in the nursery school. Um, as you see here again, the, the clothing of the, of the kids is in marvelous contrast to the drabness of the adults' clothing. Um, children enter, can enter school at three if their parents are both working. Uh, they're required to enter school at six. These, these are nursery school children in that, in that age group, of course. Um, and at that early stage, they do all the things that our nursery school kids do. They dance and play and sing. Although this is just the beginnings of an indoctrination, they just don't dance. They have dances which tend to glorify work. And these kids are probably sunflowers growing on the people's continent. Uh, but they're marvelously cheerful and uh, they have cheery art just as our nursery schools would have and all the Chinese nursery school teachers are just as loving looking as ours are. It's extraordinary. <coughs> this is um, the pupil children ratio would break your heart. In China it's one to five. That's a marvelous toy. I never thought it was a thing in, in, in this country. It's just a great big long thing and then go back and forth. It's a wonderful toy. Those are the children who put on the play for us. They're just beautiful. Yeah, they are a little older. Again, uh, a little bit of militarism. But they do some of the things these two. That girl's airplane crashed, poor thing, right after that. She had a terrible time. The classrooms are, are, um, are quite simple and undecorated. They recite for some reason at the absolute top of their voices. Um, the, uh, our kids would think that it was quite a repressive school atmosphere, as I remember it. We weren't allowed to get up and talk and run around the halls either. Uh, it's quite strict, uh, though the, uh, this kid was delivering a lecture on that. She would not be interrupted, and we almost missed the plane to Shanghai because she didn't finish her speech. In, in the nursery schools, if the parents elect, uh, the child can stay at the school through the week in, in little, uh, little bunk rooms like this. That, however, is optional. You know, if you have a grandmother at home or you get home from work early, your kids will come home. I took a lot of nursery school pictures just because I love them, so I'll show them to you. The gardens in China are, are just beautiful. This um, is Suchow. Apparently, it was a merchant city in the old days. and, and uh, Inside the house gardens, they might have an acre for the house, they would have exquisite gardens like this. This would be what you would see from the street. They made these rock formations. That was one of the art forms in China, was to sort of assemble and cool up each rock. 
they were in the nursery where they uh, had these things. The wonderful idea that, that uh, we seldom see in architecture anywhere else is the idea of creating windows and walls. In other words, created views or, or uh, the colors of walls which focus your eyes on beautiful things. This was just a wall. So the garden maintained as parks today. I'm just a few more slides on one more tray and then I'll hold up. <coughs> Gardens in Hangzhou. These are all public parks now and they were first previously the homes of the rich guys. We saw an entire nursery of these tiny little trees. Unbelievable sight. That's a main rock sculpture. They put the holes in those rocks by, by putting them in the ocean and letting the, uh, letting the water form them. It's something you did to your grandson. You, you drilled holes in the rock and put them in the ocean so they would take these fantastic shapes and your grandson would come and get them and make a form like this and sell it. Very patient people. House in Suchow and a garden in Suchow. Those were others of those upside down trees. The patience involved in doing so many of the things that we admired is absolutely unbelievable. Quite formal gardens below a pagoda in Suchow. One of those marvelous created views, you know, through windows and walls to, to, uh, to other openings and walls. My favorite little tree, which was being healed, as you see. It was just marvelous to come around a corner in a house and, and see a framed view like that. Just breathtaking. Don't pay attention to that paving. Love the little gardens, the little gardens. That's a ferry on West Lake. It's the kind of thing when you read, you know, 50 die in ferry accident. That's the ferry. It's in a park in, in Hangzhou. Crowded every day. They, uh, they don't have weekends off as we do. More or less a seventh of the population is given each day as a day of rest uh, so that the recreation facilities are not too crowded. So well, these pictures all taken an unjob. And you have to finish with the wall. You know, as many times as you've heard about the wall and seen pictures of the wall, when you actually get there, you simply cannot believe it. Um, I hadn't known so far. That wall in our terms goes from New York City to Houston, Texas, in case you don't know how long it is. As you can see, it's quite large. The, um, it's 2,600 miles long. You'll get an idea of the height of it in pictures like this. They tend to keep to the ridges, which accounts for its terribly circular shape, so it often doubles back on itself for that reason. The wall was not intended, I hadn't known this, not intended to keep people out. Um, its primary purpose, we were told by the Chinese, was to keep out horses. In other words, if you, if you storm this wall with enough people and enough ladders, you could get your troops over. The only one who ever got his horses over was Genghis Khan, who was in China for some time there. That's an extraordinary sight. They were getting an idea to win. That was our favorite interpreter, Mr. 
Down at the bottom there is the tourist area. This part of the wall has been restored as a tourist attraction, and the Chinese come out on their day off in, in buses. Building on the wall. The end. Thank you very much.